there is a famous quote by Abigail Adams. Let's not forget the women. So we won't. March is National Women's History Month when we recognize all women and their accomplishments and deeds, whether in the home, business, or our community. The Berks Women's History Alliance is once again partnering with the Berks History Center to promote these women. The following program celebrates women who were, and are currently, first in their field in Berks County. This project was first introduced in 2007 by the Berks Women's Commission and showcased at their Women's History Museum at the Goggle Works. We have updated this project since we know there has continued to be more Berks County women who have become first in their field. We celebrate to remind ourselves of the journey taken to achieve these accomplishments and to honor those trailblazing women who continue to lead the way. Our journey of firsts starts with Juliana Philippi Shearer, believed to be the first female born in the city of Reading in 1753 after it was chartered. She became the wife of Christopher Shearer, grandfather of the famous artist, and some of whose paintings hang in the Burke's History Center. She is buried in Charles Evans Cemetery. Although we know there are many, many more females who were first in their fields over the next 250 years, this program focuses on the women who have achieved this title in the last 100 plus years. We know we haven't found all of you yet. However, the Berks Women's History Alliance looks forward to continuously updating this exclusive group of women who were first. To the women of Berks County, we thank you. We can take great pride and satisfaction for your part in recording these accomplishments so future generations continue to see the best is yet to be. It's time to meet some of these trailblazing women. Hello, I am Vicki Hefner, Education Curator of the Berks History Center and member of the Berks Women's History Alliance. My co-host, Carol Toomey, also a member of the Berks Women's History Alliance, and I will be introducing you to several of the women who were the first in their field in Berks County. Rachel Griscom, first school teacher in Reading, 1835, taught until she retired in 1860. Rachel, what motivated you to become involved in this field? Well, <clears throat> as a young Quaker woman, I was educated. I know that sounds hard to believe, but at the time, mostly boys were educated and girls were not. And most of the boys in Reading were taught in their school, uh, in their church schools by uh, men. In 1834, when the Pennsylvania school law passed, it was said that all children in Pennsylvania in grades one to eight had to be educated in public schools. I was a Quaker woman and I knew how to read and write. And so I was invited to uh, teach in the first school in Reading, which was held in the basement of a Universalist church in the South Ward. So being educated, I wanted to help others, and I wanted to teach our young boys and girls to read and write, because the Quakers believed in the equality of all people, and everyone was equal in the eyes of God. I'm sure you experienced many challenges. Can you talk about a few? Many challenges. First of all, there was resentment uh, of my position and the whole public school law. The parents of Reading were afraid that their German children would lose their culture and their language because the Pennsylvania school law said that the children must be educated and learn English. And so that was number one obstacle. When we started the school in the Universalist basement of the church, we had no desks. 
We had no tables. Um, and so I asked some carpenters who made some benches for the children. We had no books. Many of the children brought their Bibles from home. However, some of them were in German. We had five used arithmetic books that we could use. And so those were some obstacles. The first day of school, there were 50 children there. The second day, there were 80. And after two weeks, there were 105 children there. The attendance was not always the same because the children were often working at home or they had already started on the job training with their dads. Their mothers had to help or their the girls had to help their mothers taking care of the younger children, cooking and baking. And then, of course, there were the anti-school men. The anti-school men were a group of German men who wanted to overthrow the Pennsylvania school law, and they wanted to keep things the way they had always been. These men were going to make up their own political party and have their own slate of officers, and they were determined to overthrow the new law. So those were the biggest obstacles that I had. Oh, and I forgot to mention, probably the most was difficult obstacle was that almost all of the ch children spoke only German, and so I had to teach them English also. What advice would you give to all young women just starting their career paths? I would say for young women to get all the education that they can and learn to serve humanity because service to others is uh, what we were all taught in the Bible. And then after the Civil War, Rachel, you helped collect money for the Reading Dispensary, which would later become the Reading Hospital. Yes. In 1860, when Civil War was raging and about to begin, I started this because I knew we would need a larger dispensary. Uh, and luckily, it did become the Reading Hospital. And after the war, I... I um, started a home for widows and single women here in Reading, those who had been widowed by some of their husbands who had died in the Civil War and were left with children also. So my whole life I dedicated in serving others. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Bronwyn Gamble recently retired executive director of the Reading Public Library and the first female director of the library's history. What motivated you to become involved in this field? I was always a reader, but that's really not why you become a librarian. 
Um, I can remember playing with my dad's name stamp and index cards and pretending that I was the librarian when I was just little, like five or six. Um, I also worked in my college library, the Behrend campus of Penn State, but never thought of it as a career until I lived in Queechee, Vermont, and my kid's school librarian left abruptly. And because I had some library experience, I stepped in and kept it going. And the principal said, you know, you really, you really should go and get an MLS so you could be our school librarian. But in Queechee, Vermont, the closest was either Albany, New York, or Boston, Massachusetts. So that didn't happen until we moved to New Jersey, and then Rutgers was just an hour away, and I could actually pursue that. Is there a particular accomplishment you are proud of? I think being the first um, as executive director, you think of librarians as all women, but for some reason, administration is often men. Um, you know, the library was established in 1763, so that's a long time to wait for that first. But I think also that in 2018, Reading Public Library was one of five libraries nationwide to be awarded the National Medal for Outstanding Community Service by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And what advice do you have for all young women just starting out their career plans? Don't be so concerned with what other people think of you and your path. I also think negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Women aren't very good at asking for what they deserve and need. Um, and be a connector, not just a networker. You know, connect your colleagues together. And did you receive any female support, mentoring, or opposition? I received great female support um, from school librarians, from the head of the, um, in the Library and Information Sciences School at Rutgers, which was Betty Turok. She was also the president of, of the American Library Association. And um, just, you know, encouragement, even from my coworkers that, yes, we believe in what you're doing and, and we're happy with that. Thank you, Bronwyn. You're welcome.
Welcome Rosa Julia Para, business leader and community volunteer, founder and editor of Palo Magazine, the first bilingual magazine in Berks County, also owner of Palo Homes LLC and owner of Palo Graphics. Welcome Rosa. Thank you, thank you for having me. What motivated you to become involved in the journalism field? Um, it was very odd normally, um, Sometimes you hear people say that they've known since they were five years old what they wanted to do. That wasn't my case. I actually worked in banking for many years, probably up to around 36 or 37 years of age. Um, I went to take my mom out to eat for Mother's Day at a restaurant that my brother owned. And when we were there, um, I meet the DJ and the DJ there saw that I was reading a book or a magazine in a bar restaurant. And he said that was the oddest thing that he's seen in all his years of DJing. So he said to me, I would love to do a magazine one day. And I said, I would like to do a cookbook. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe we should get together. So he gave me his number and I gave him my number. He said he would be calling me. And then he pitched the idea of doing a magazine to me. It was not my idea. I always say I stole it. Um, he was a complete stranger and that stranger became my husband. So we call Palo Magazine like our baby because we did this together. We started this project together. It was his idea for a while. He kept pitching it to other people. No one paid attention to him. And they said, oh, that's kind of hard to do. Um, and I just thought it was a wonderful idea. The Latino community didn't have anything here as a resource to read like this. So the magazine actually started in Spanish in the beginning. Um, and then one day, probably about a year and a half after or two, um, someone that I saw in the street, a lawyer said, I like this magazine. It's, it's beautiful, but I don't understand it. It's all in Spanish. How would I advertise if I don't know what content you're putting in here? And I thought, you know what? I'm from Berks County. Why? And I'm bi fully bilingual, complete, grew up with both cultures. Why not make the magazine for everybody? And that's when I did the transformation over to a complete bilingual magazine. So banker for almost 20 years. Yes. Founder of a bilingual magazine. Yes. And now you're flipping homes. And I'm flipping homes now too. <laughs> they say don't keep all, all your eggs in one nest, right? So, and COVID I think has taught us too. Sometimes you got to mingle in a little other thing because you never know. Um, you could have a business or something that completely shuts down. Um, and so it's good to have a little bit of investment, a little bit here and there. So and probably in a month or so, I just, I'm purchasing two properties um, in Puerto Rico. And I believe if everything comes out the way I'm planning, I should be starting two Airbnbs in Puerto Rico as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm mixing it up. I'm getting older and I'm thinking, hey, it's, I got to move. I got to make up for all the time that I sat in a cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> Rosa, you mentioned uh, first starting out as a Spanish magazine and then an obstacle was advertising and then you became a bilingual magazine so you could do it in English and Spanish. Were there other obstacles that you encountered? Yes, there was various obstacles in, in both cultures, the, the non-Latino and the Latino. For example, um, my husband would go to see a client and then when I would go later to follow up with that client or pick up a payment or so, um, I would run into some mail that would say, well, I'm not dealing with you. I'm dealing with your husband only. Um, and I would say, well, it's my magazine. He's helping me because, um, in actuality it was my husband's idea, but six months after he did it, he thought, ah, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this. I, I already lost it, whatever, but I didn't. This is where I saw my passion to write and express myself. So it became my baby. And so I had to deal with that, like in the Latino culture, um, even though it was a little bit easier because he's a radio personality, people knew him and trusted him. But so it took me a while. Um, and I came from sitting in a cubicle. No one knew me where my husband was locally known being on the radio. So, you know, I understand that there was a trust factor there as well, but also in the non-Latino side as well, I think advertising could be a lot better. I think I should have a lot more advertising that I even have today. I, I still think there's a barrier there. I, I don't understand what the barrier is yet, and I'm working on that. Um, but it's been successful. It's it's I mean, I put I'm on my second child that I'm putting through college. Um, I took a leap of faith. I was working full time in a stable company and I went no insurance, no nothing. I, I really took a, a leap of faith. And sometimes we don't do that. You know, we're, we're a little scared. So you deal with 
these things. You don't even realize you're dealing with these obstacles, but when you're committed and you want to do something that no one's done before, it, it, you just keep muddling through. You just do it. If you're passionate enough, you, you won't stop. No one's going to stop you. And please tell me, Rosa, when was the first issue of Palo? What year? I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was May of 2010. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's, Did you it's, receive it's, any female support, uh, mentoring, or opposition throughout your career as a magazine editor? It's, it's really hard because when you go to someone else, it's you, when you live in a smaller town, you go to somebody else who has another magazine, they, you know, they might see you as competition and that you're coming to them to steal all their, their answers. Um, so I didn't go that route. So I'm, I'm a reader, naturally a reader. So I just looked up everything, you know, I, now I'm not saying I didn't have any mentors, but they weren't mentors of someone who's already done this. You know, I almost think that I am the first um, Latina to do a bilingual publication. So I didn't have that mentor to look up that way, but there's so many women in the community that are doing other things and they don't mind um, giving you advice because sometimes it's not another woman that does a magazine. She might know a little bit about business or Rosa, hey, you know your ads, you might want to try to sell this. You know, so I always got those tips from women, which were great. You could work at a factory and give me a good tip about running my magazine without even realizing it. You know, there's many, I've had women. Well, my next issue for March is going to be on women. And instead of doing professional women, I'm going to go out and interview women from factories because I think they're almost like the forgotten heroes that go home and work and come home and do the same. And maybe they want to do something different and they feel stuck or, you know, maybe they stay there because they have good pay or maybe they don't have self-esteem. So that's what I'm going to do this month. Cause I, I kind of felt like there's something missing. And without me realizing it, I was just picking the professional women that, that already show up in 50 million places. So Sometimes it's good to go to people like my mom or somebody like that, that never um, was a professional that field, but she sure did know how to cook and take care of us. And sometimes we, we need to applaud those women as well. You know, we need to lift their spirits as well. And if you could give any advice to a young, young woman starting out in this career, what would you say? Oh my goodness. What would I say? <laughs> that I'm only going to tap a little bit on that because there are so many things I could say. But one of them is sometimes we have so much fear in us. And sometimes that fear could be instilled with all due respect. It could come from your grandma. It could come from your mom. Innocently, though, not that your grandma or mom don't want to see you prosper. But sometimes they might say like, oh, well, you know what? I think it's better if you get a stable job. And I think, you know, at least you have benefits here. And I think we need to follow that gut feeling that you have. And if someone, one time I remember when I got laid off from the bank, somebody said, hey, Rosa, you should get into nursing. They pay really good. I said, what would I do there? You know, because that was not my thing. Um, I said, if I see blood, I'll probably pass out. I would not be a good nurse. Um, also, you, there's different things that, you know, I feel that you need as a nurse. So my, my advice would be follow your passion. Follow something that you're good at. You know, if you're, if you've been doing makeup since you were a little girl and you're good at it and all your family said, that's probably most likely your calling in some way or, or, or shape. Um, and don't get discouraged. So I think we have to dream bigger and you can still do what you love. Um, nowadays they can invent their own sneakers and become millionaires and still be in that field, go to colleges, talk to students. I mean, there's just so much. I think that, um, I think the only person that puts a stop to your dreams is yourself. I think we like to say, well, my mom doesn't allow, oh, my husband or my brother. I don't think that's true. I think that's an excuse that we use as humans to, to not put that extra oomph and, and do extra work. So I think that we all have that in this. We just have to really dig in there and, 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 and be consistent with it. Rosa, certainly you're a first female in Berks County. If you had any parting words to say, what would it be? I would have to say, as I said before, keep, keep pushing. Um, yes, you can, you can do this. Um, and sometimes you don't need a mob of people behind you to help you. Um, you have to believe in yourself and, um, yes, you can, you can do it. And in Spanish, we say, si se puede. Thank you. You're welcome.
Karen Miller, Outstanding Career in City and State Government, First Female on City Council, First Female Mayor of Reading in 1979, and first to be reelected to a consecutive term in 100 years. What motivated you to become involved in this field, Karen? Probably like most people who get into politics, I was angry. I, <laughs> I thought there has to be a better way to run the city. I had been active in the League of Women Voters and had done some door-to-door -door work and other volunteer activities for other political candidates. But it was basically, I just got really annoyed um, and thought, this has to change. There was also um, somebody, Sam Caldicerone, um, who knew politics well in Reading, and he said it's about time that a woman be able to run and win for city council. But that was difficult for me because um, from the external part, I, I was not from Reading. I lived in Reading all of four years. Um, I was practically unknown to everybody outside the 8th Ward, which was teeny tiny up against um, uh, City Park. And uh, there was no money available practically. Um, and so I thought, and I was a woman. Uh, but it was 1975 and, and times were changing. So I decided to run. But then I began to think, oh, this is terribly expensive, and a lot of it's going to have to come out of our family money. So I was thinking of dropping out of the race even before I really got into it when I found out that my husband had bought two billboards, <laughs> um, well-placed billboards, and I was too frugal slash cheap to say that we're going to throw that money out the window, so I guess I better run after all. So that's what I did. You had a lot of obstacles to overcome. Are there any others? Well, let's see. I was a woman. I wasn't from here. Um, I had a small child. Um, and the party structure wanted me to wait my turn and not run against incumbents. I addressed them. Uh, one, I obviously I I was very happy to be a woman, so I wasn't too worried about that. I recognized that that could be a problem, but it could be a, a positive because it was 1975 by this time. Um, I wasn't from Reading. I addressed that by saying, making it part of my pitch. I would say my husband and I were not lucky enough to have been born in Reading, but we chose Reading as our home as a place to raise our family and live out our years in safety and dignity. Ta-da! Okay, then, um, as far as the party structure, I simply ignored it. I did, however, talk to all of the uh, committee people to show them respect, because I was a committee person by that time. Um, but um, as far as taking orders from any of the party officials, no. So your position in city council led to your mayor run? Yes. Uh, it, it was amusing since they, the members of city council were in charge of various departments. One of the members of city council was called the mayor. There were five members of city council, one of whom was called the mayor. The rest of us were assigned to various departments. They couldn't see that I was going to be in charge of the fire department. So this is time one time when sexism worked for me, and they said, "Well, yeah, I guess you will be head of direct, you'll be director of accounts and finance," which also puts put me in the acting mayor spot when the mayor was out of town. Um, I ended up opposing uh, other members of city council on occasion, but basically, I, I just liked working with them. And did you receive any female support or mentoring? There was nobody to mentor me. Um, did I receive female support? Oh, yes, by all means, especially during the campaign. 
Um, my friends in the League of Women Voters dropped out of the League because they couldn't take political positions um, in the League. And they helped me with everything from running the spaghetti dinner fundraises to doing babysitting for five-year-old Josh to um, coming up with ideas that hadn't been done before which would end up bringing me to people's attention, such as instead of giving out the plastic homes that everybody else gave out, we gave out parsley seeds. And my husband even found that there at the, at the bars, there were about 100 neighborhood <laughs> bars in Reading at that time, and he would be working the bars and bringing my, my campaign stuff around to all the, these folks. And um, they, the parsley seeds were received well every place. Um, in fact, and and it was at the one of the bars I think that we began to realize in 1975 the times had changed because Barry would give somebody the seeds and the guy said, "Yeah, or my wife or my aunt or whatever would would like these," and and then they said, "Ah." I'll give the broad a chance. The guy, she can't screw it up any worse than the guys have. Okay, <laughs> so that, and then going door to door, I would notice that people, that a woman would open the door and look to the left and look to the right to see if her neighbors were noticing that she was talking to me. And then she would say, it's about time we got a woman in there. Times have changed. Karen Miller 2007, named Distinguished Daughter of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. Thank
Hi, I'm Carol Chunli here with Dr. Courtney McKay Stevens. And Courtney was the first president of the Berks County Commission for Women. Courtney, I'm so happy you are here, and I am really curious as to what motivated you to become involved in and to really create the Berks County Commission for Women. How you did it, when you did it, and, and how did you accomplish all that? Well, it certainly wasn't an I process. The Commission for Women was built on the community base of the women's organizations in this area coming together in, I would say, a decades-long process of developing unity among themselves to give leadership to women in this community based on the political system. We had our individual organizations, most of them were 501c3 nonprofits with the goals of helping women in particular areas like the American Association of University of Women or the League of Women Voters with their individual agendas coming together to form, in the sense of history, a more powerful union together and to accomplish things at that level, which we could never have accomplished individually. Well, you certainly have accomplished a lot for women because you are truly an advocate of, for women's mm -hmm. issues, especially in your professional career as a professor of nursing at Alvernia University. You've always been very, women's health has always yes. been very important to you. Now, and obviously you've received that female support from other organizations, but was there anyone individually that could have, that gave you that support? I think professionally, uh, Cora Jane Durling, who was the Director of Patient Services in Days of Yore at St. Joseph, was the first one to hire me in this community, who was an outsider. So much of the healthcare system here was based on those who went to the same school of nursing and then uh, advanced in their careers within their own medical centers. But she took a risk in me. You might guess I was not born in Barks County. <laughs> and she took a risk that because I had a specialty from Boston University in maternal child health, that I could give leadership to women's health in this community. So I'm very grateful that she took a risk. Courtney, when you were with the uh, Berks County Commission for Women, what did you feel was one of your major accomplishments? Well, we certainly had numbers of areas that we spent our energy and time in. But one that I remember uh, specifically was mammography project. And this was to give women information uh, in order to make wise decisions. If we don't have information, we guess. And so the Mammography Project was to provide women with information on availability, hours of service, cost, and none of that was available in one place for women to find information. And so the Commission for Women gathered that information. Some facilities more resident, uh, uh, hesitant than others to provide that information to us. But in the end, we did compile it. We published it, and we made it available in numerous community sites for women and bilingually to be able to make wise decisions and to be able now 
to find that information is a law in the state of Pennsylvania. So the Commission for Women of Berks County was a real leader in this advocacy for women's health. That's great. You saw a need, you went after it, you solved, you solved the need and created the answer. Thank you. Well, these accomplishments in the medical field, the education field, I assume these are some of the accomplishments that uh, helped you become listed in Who's Who <laughs> of American Women in 1993. Yes. Um, and also one that might not be in history books, but certainly was history here, was that I was the first uh, woman deacon invited to a Southern Baptist church in this area. And the anecdote of that was um, the director of the association then said to my church, well, I cannot support that. But as Baptists, you're allowed to make your own mistakes. Ooh. <laughs> so I was a mistake oh, no. <laughs> in his opinion, but certainly not in the churches. And that's the kind of affirmation we need as any leaders in a community, our own support system from those who know us best. Well, I could see what kind of advice you would be giving to young women who are just starting their career path. Is there anything else that stands out that you would encourage young women to do or say? Absolutely. Find your own support system. I remember one of the presidents of uh, Burke's Women's Network advised all of our members to create their own personal board of directors. That is people to surround a young woman developing her career who will speak truth to her, not just things she wants to hear or accomplishments, but friends who will speak truth to you and support you. I would call them any time of day or night friends. When you need support, need validation, and need wisdom in making decisions. So, both personally and career wise. And those may be two different groups of people, but with the, always the agenda of helping an individual advance. Well, you certainly have had a lot of support in your advancement. Could you imagine that you ever had any opposition? That oh, you had my to goodness, yes. <laughs> I would say probably more opposition um, over the decades because when uh, it's described as cutting edge, there's a bleeding edge <laughs> as well. And so it takes a pretty straight uh, spine to pursue one's passion and to be an advocate for people who have either no voice or a weak voice in their community. And coming together, we can have a stronger voice. That is so true. So very, very true. Well, you've had so many accomplishments from being the first president of the Berks County Commission for Women, your first female deacon in your church, you authored Preparation for Parenthood, you were a professor of nursing at Alvernia University and, and advocated for women's health, and you were listed in the Who's Who in American Women. And you certainly are a wonderful role model for all of us, and we are so glad you are the first in so many fields. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome Beulah Boots Fair, first female president of the Board of Trustees of the Berks History Center, also the founder of Antietam Lake Friends, and also the Friedman Gallery. Welcome Boots, how are you? I'm fine, and you Vicki? I'm doing really great, this is a lot of fun. Tell me, what got you motivated in the history field, the museum field, and what started you here at the Berks History Center? Well, I think what really started me was my family. They were always very interested in the history of Berks County. And um, I guess somehow or other I came in here to um, volunteer as a docent. Well, we called ourselves tour guides then. We, we weren't fancy docents, we were tour guides. And then we started a whole group. We had about 15, and it was a very dynamic group, and we were giving tours all the time. And what really pleased me is that this fourth grade school children in Reading could come every year to for a tour. And I loved giving the children tours. They were enthusiastic and cute. And they'd come down the steps and they'd see the covered wagon, or the Conestoga wagon, and say, oh, they were just amazed at things. And then they would take them in the hand rooms and the hands-on room, and they would have fun playing. So it was a great tour, I think, for them. They and then that it. led to you being a trustee for the Burke Eventually, I became a trustee, and then eventually I became the president. I was the first woman president. First female president of the Burke's History Center. That's right. And what obstacles did you encounter being the first female president, if uh, any? Well, I don't think I encountered any problems. Um, everyone just accepted it, you know, because I've been here that long. And we were all working together, so I don't. As a woman, I, I felt no problem whatsoever. And you're also uh, involved with Friedman Gallery. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Well, the Friedman Gallery is at Albright College, and it was built, let me see, I had it around, uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, in the late 80s. And it's a, a complete, a, a magnificent um, gallery. It's devoted to uh, contemporary artists. Doris Friedman had gone to Albright College, and she is the one that financed the uh, building of the gallery. Um, she very, was very instrumental in New York City, the Friedman Foundation, in doing art, outside of art in New York City, painting a lot of buildings and putting sculpture around the city. So um, I invited about 10 of my friends, and they invited their friends. So we became the friends of Antietam Lake, and uh, I mean, sorry, friends of Greenman Gallery. And uh, every time they had an opening, we'd have a reception. We had many receptions with the different artists. We did fundraising in private houses. We had speakers. And um, we felt we did a great deal of service to the friends as the friends of the Freedmen. We worked very hard at it. We called ourselves a think tank. Mm -hmm. We sort of get together and just think what we could do. So, so it was Boots, very satisfying. And Albright's a wonderful college. Boots, you're first in museum field as the president of the Berks History Center, a first with the Friends of Antietam Lake. That's right. And a first with the Friends of Freedmen Gallery. Yeah, isn't it amazing? It's amazing. Can you give any advice to young women today uh, figuring out their career paths? Well, if you believe in something, go for it 100%. Um, there are so many opportunities for young women. And uh, I was just fortunate that these came my way. But um, uh, never be bashful. Just try your best. And, and have a good group of friends around and help you. Thank you, Boots. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs>